looking at this for the first time. The sacred actions, um, and actually the Friday night is, is one, of, one of those. And I think what, what Judaism has done is to harness what is absolutely instinctive to us, which is about families and generations and passing on truth. I've got a variety of lovely holler covers here, but I'm actually going to use this one tonight because it's a little bit bigger. Um, there we are. And that goes over there. And these are the traditional items you'll find in, in any Jewish house on a Friday night. Silver candlesticks, silver goblet for the wine, and the two holler brads with the lovely covering. I think a lot of traditional families like myself will do this to be together and to be part of the family and to commemorate the Friday night and to keep the tradition going. Um, I use it to, to be with the family and to make the children feel part of the family unit, but I also do it to try and foster my relationship with God and the children's relationship with God. Everybody get ready and remember what we do on a Friday night. I mean, the thing about the, about the evening gathering is that, that there are symbol, you know, that there are things that, and, you know, Wendy said, why should I break something that's been happening for 2,000 years? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to carry on with the light, with the bread, with mm -hmm. the wine. I'm bringing these things forward, you know, to my children and to my family and to this environment. Sacred actions are anchoring you, rooting you in the everyday. Yes. They, they, they're giving you points of contact with, with the real world. So they're, they're building a culture yes. in, in that sense. And, and there's a Jewish culture, a, a Jewish way of doing things, and there's a Catholic culture, a Catholic way of doing things. I was surprised that so many people, so many people were there for the Latin Mass and they sang in Latin and we asked the priest if they were taught these uh, different uh, prayers that were sung and they said no, they just come there and they pick it up and, and it was beautifully done and I really enjoyed it. When I was thinking about the Latin Mass and the fact that I didn't really quite know what was going on, and in some ways that maybe that made me kind of concentrate a bit more. And perhaps sometimes in Mass I'm a bit on autopilot. I know exactly when to stand up, sit down, you know, do everything. For my, what I think what Catholics would find uh, comfortable or affirming in that ritual, for me, is that individually people can immerse themselves in the ritual without attending to the surface. Because one of my little pet lines is, one reason the ritual's the same is that I'm never the same going there. From Sunday to Sunday, I'm different. And the ritual allows me to bring that, that new situation, new reality, to a place that I can be comfortably being this new self that I am. With the congregation, are they like taught Latin or, or how are they kind of brought into it? Well, I mean, I would say, um, you know, the people who come to the Latin Mass tend to come on a regular basis. Mm. Uh, and so it's, uh, I mean, I suppose familiarity is, is the thing. But the Latin in some ways is a, is a I think it, it's a root, if you will, to the origins of, of the faith. Because even within the Latin Mass, there is a bit of Hebrew, and there's a bit of Greek. The cultural heritage is, is lived out, if you will, within, that, in, within all Masses. but maybe more so maybe in the Latin Mass. You can get more formalised rituals which become liturgies, to use and a different sort of word, which in certainly Catholic Christian terms are very much recounting the Christian story with the proclamation of the Gospel and the, the Eucharist which itself, of course, is based upon a number of different rituals and ritual gestures, blessings, movements, prayers, all of which have a particular uh, formal purpose. We are physical beings. We are not disembodied spirits or minds. We are physical beings. We are beings with, 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 with senses and also with great psychological needs. 
And so we express ourselves not only in terms of text and study, but also in terms of acts. And that these acts can offer us insights because they're attuned to our own nature and can help us have a sense of God uh, that would not be available from a purely literate or, or uh, um, engagement, a purely intellectual engagement. You know, God is made present in the actual action of the reading of the scriptures and the celebration of the Eucharist. And I think something like that is, some, is happening um, when the Guru Granth is taken out and when, it, when it's read. In other words, the reading itself is a sacred act. Now, in Sikhism, there are no rituals. Absolutely. Okay. But what we're also interested in are what we, what we call domestic rituals, the things that go on in the home. In other words, the prayers which are part of everyday life. Now, I just wonder... I don't think that is a ritual because you have a habit or you want to sit and communicate with God. It's not a ritual. You are trying to talk to... It's like me getting up in the morning saying, Dad, how are you? You know, it's, it doesn't become a ritual because you want to be able to communicate. He's your father, he's your mother, he's your brother, he's your sister. You communicate with them. There are all sorts of sacred actions. They don't like the word ritual, and I can understand that because I know where they're coming from. They're, they're very, very uh, critical of types of religion, okay, which seem to be uh, obscuring the, the simplicity, shall we say, of, of the presence of, of God. Our little group, you know, as part of Faiths Together, we had to study a little bit more about the Sikh faith. We usually ended up in a Sikh uh, place of worship and to, for hundreds of us to sit down and to be fed was, was really hospitality. And I think that's what's about all the different faiths, but the Sikhs are very special in that way. And what I saw was the equality between the men and the women the men serving and helping with the washing up, you know, all together, was really, really wonderful. You do certain things because you do them, and you don't really think very much about them. Okay, and, and what you get in, in Sikhism is, is very much a, a return to uh, a certain understanding of God and God's dealings with human beings. You know, there are certain ways God communicates with humans. You know, there's verbal communication and there's non-verbal communication. Now, the verbal communication is through sending the scripture. So this is verbal communication, God communicates with humans. Well, that's on their part, humans also communicate with God through the act mm -hmm. of supplication. I mean, in English, we could talk about the prayer or praying. What you just saw being filmed there by Sheikh Ahmed was, was called Salat, which is a format of, of ritual praying. And most of it is you, you speak, uh, you learn bits of Arabic from the Quran and things from the Sunnah, from the Hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, there are portions of that ritual prayer where you can say things in English. So for example, when your head is on the, on the floor in, in what's called sajda, prostration, you say the form of words, but you can also personalize things because that's when you're closest to God. There's also fikr, which is reflection, which is you meditate. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you know, an hour's worth of meditation is worth a lifetime of prayer, or 80 years of prayer, I think it is. Some Muslims, because they're so busy with their daily lives, they can actually put the noon prayer and they can put the afternoon prayer together, especially within Britain, where there is uh, hardly ever time given to actually uh, take out five, ten minutes to pray. The closest parallel to what you're talking about in the Islamic tradition, praying five times a day, is the sort of thing you get in the Christian monastic traditions, um, such as we found in the, in, in the Coptic church. Um, the, you know, the bishop was a monk, and uh, he, he, he showed us the book, and in the book you have prayer five times a day. We have um, a book of daily offices, starting from the first hour in the morning, third hour, sixth hour, ninth hour, eleventh hour, twelfth hour, you know, ritual has, in some 
in some circles become a very has become a very controversial and sometimes derogative term. Um, for us, ritual is different because our daily rituals are not just practices of letter; they are practices of letter and spirit. I think this is where people who spend too much time being very picky with the sacred actions that they actually miss the whole point. And this is something that I have a problem where too much emphasis is placed on the sacred actions where it ends up just being actions. If you pray and you, you have all, and you know all the rules and you follow everything literally, but your heart was not really you know, you are not concentrating on God. Your, your heart was somewhere else. What's the point of prayer? So look at it as, as a body and a soul. You will say that a, a body without a soul has no meaning whatsoever. So the emphasis should be in meaning. That doesn't mean you, you will neglect the, the body. So there should be a balance, but the essential element is the soul. I prefer my sort of musical image, you know, you, when you play a symphony, you don't play it approximately. <laughs> um, if you did, uh, the, the audience would be storming out. At the same time, you can have music in which there are variations on the theme. That's what jazz is all about. Yes. But even with jazz, there are rules within which you have to work. The musical analogy is so clever because playing music well requires a discipline and attention to detail and a taking it seriously and and all sorts of things which um, aren't, aren't about the, the sort of getting it exactly the same as the person who played that piece in the time of Bach, but they are about maintaining maintaining standards, I suppose, is is, is really what I'm talking about. Yet at the same time, every performance is different. Yes. And you put your own stamp on it. Yes. And that is part of your creativity. Yes, yes, that's and right. that's different and new every time for you. So it's coming back to this point about remembrance. Yeah. And that is at the heart of all sacred actions, what they call to mind, mm -hmm. how they bring you into the, into the present moment. The problem comes when, we keep coming back to this, where the spirit, what you're actually trying to remember, gets forgotten. Who wants to hear the Tree of Life? Oh, I just love to hear it. Yeah, let's Avenu shalom alechem, avenu shalom. I mean, it's interesting, this discussion is what makes something sacred? And in a way, what made that evening sacred wasn't just that it was an act of remembrance that's been passed down for 2,000 years. It, to me, it was the intention of the people who were around that table. It was their intention, which was a very clear, deliberate setting aside of this time, wanting to do this thing together, wanting, you know, the, the, the deep intention of, of bringing something forward that made it different from just doing something by rote or something I mean, as an act of ritual. It made it, yeah, that's right. It was a living spirit coming out of that. So th that, that, that's what made it sacred to me. What is the significance uh, of this place? Chanted threads. These are a protection from all um, negative influences. When we went to the Buddhist service, and right at the end, people lined up to get a, a piece of, oh wow, orange thread, such as what Eileen's got there. And I felt something as the priest put the thread on me, which I hadn't expected at all, but he was praying and there was some sort of feeling. And throughout that evening, every time I looked at it, I got the sense of him praying. 